get going. Uh, thanks uh, everybody for registering and for participating in our webinar. So uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Wellington Spedek. I'm with uh, Anderson, of course, School of Management. Uh, I have Garima Sharma, a colleague who's also a faculty uh, here at Anderson. And um, before I get into the introductions of our great speakers, I just want to give you a little bit or tell you a little bit where this came from. So a couple of weeks ago, we we're discussing a ways we could give back or you know, help our business community somehow. And we came up with the idea of a webinar, of course, and uh, reached, reached out to uh, some of our partners, our New Mexico B Corps, uh, the Economic Development Department, and other partners. And in a matter of hours, we had people raising their hands, say, oh, um, I'm here to help, let's, yeah, I, I volunteer. So I guess in a week or so, we put this together and um, we had 200, over 250 people registered for it. So it's been amazing, I was impressed and really actually happy to um, you know, see that uh, support. So thanks again, uh, everybody for um, the support. Um, so I promised to, to stay under three minutes, so I'm um, gonna have to get going here before I introduce our presenters. So today we're uh, bringing this uh, through what we call our New Mexico for Good program, which is a program that we just started uh, at the end of the last year. And um, there are three main um, objectives with that, this program. So if you want more information, you can always email me. The information is gonna be right here under this slide. Um, so research, uh, we have two research projects going on um, in New Mexico right now. Um, we're gonna be doing some what we call the big corp clinics or the student teams that will be helping uh, companies that uh, you know, are trying to be, become big corp certified. So that's the idea of to have something in the fall um, depending how we come back um, uh, for the next semester, of course. And the third um, objective of the program is to organize or to convene change makers. So this is an example of one thing that we're doing. So hopefully if you're interested, just let me know, contact me. Uh, as I said, we're just starting this, so more will come uh, in the next few months. Um, and then that, that's about it about us. It's just not about uh, Anderson or New Mexico Food Program. This is about uh, what we can discuss today and how we can give back or how we can exchange ideas about the current situation, right? So um, for those of you that uh, have never used Zoom or are not familiar, which is at this point unlikely, right? Uh, we have here some of the ways that you can participate. So just go ahead and click on the chat button there if you wanna ask a question. Uh, we will be recording this webinar and the chat. So uh, we would like to circulate um, the webinar and the questions or the discussions that show up later on for those that registered. Um, I would like to ask you to keep your video uh, off and you are by default muted. So by all means use that uh, chat button to ask questions and put in some comments. And uh, just like to uh, recognize our New Mexico B Corps that have been quite supportive of the Mexico Boot for Program and especially uh, John Martz with Santa Fe Innovates, who has been really supportive of, of the program. And um, of course, our Columbia Development Department and Santa Fe Green Chamber of Commerce who have stepped up as soon as we came up with this idea. Okay, so without further ado, um, we have four amazing speakers today. Um, Don Bulver from uh, Taos Key Valley, um, Johanna Nelson, Economic Development Department, Doug Lynn, um, Longview Asset Management, and Drew uh, Tochen. So the idea here is, is pretty simple, I guess. We're gonna open in for our speakers and they're gonna discuss a little bit about their topics. And I guess we're gonna follow this order here if it's okay with Don starting. And then we're gonna open for questions and comments and um, go from there. So, but anytime they are uh, talking, you may go ahead and use that chat button to ask specific questions. And I think that's it from my side. Um, I think we could get going. John, Don, are, are you ready? Sure, yeah, I'll hop in. 
Great. Well, thanks for everybody for being on the Zoom. And thanks to um, Wellington and Garima for setting this time up for everyone to kind of come together and talk about um, what we're going to be looking at going forward. Um, what I was planning to share today was just a little bit of our journey up till now and kind of how we're thinking um, moving forward. So, um, you know, initially, uh, we had a uh, plan to close early. We were one of the first resorts to make that announcement. And uh, it was uh, shut down quite early um, because uh, of what was going on in the high country in Colorado and the governor of Colorado's decision to close resorts in Colorado. Um, we couldn't in good conscience stay open, um, even though things in our state um, weren't moving in that direction yet, um, because our concern was everybody who was um, locked out of Colorado would come down to New Mexico, and we certainly couldn't do that to our community and our uh, local hospital. It just seemed really not the right thing to do. So we shut down within a couple of days. Um, and uh, we shut down in one of our most busy periods. I was sharing with Garima earlier that it was a time uh, when uh, we have um, one of our main revenue streams is during spring break. And so um, it was pretty devastating financially, um, but we were most concerned about the community um, and certainly our guests and our, and our staff and how to keep them healthy and safe. So, uh, we shut everything down. We literally walked away from the mountain. There's quite a bit of tear down and taking down the mountain at the end of the season and that was all put on hold. So uh, we promptly uh, uh, committed to our seasonal staff to pay them through the end of the month. Um, then we did the same for our full-time year-round staff. Uh, we paid them for an extra week uh, while we tried to apply for a Paycheck Protection Program loan. Uh, we had some concerns there. Uh, there were some affiliation um, concerns uh, with our ownership, uh, but the, the specific law talked a lot about um, the 72 NAICS code, which has to do with um, mountain resorts that have lodging. Um, so we were able to qualify with that. And um, we worked with a local bank we've established a really long term relationship with over um, the over the honestly the last 40 years. Um, and they were really helpful in securing that loan. So once we were able to take care of our staff and have a long term plan for them for the next um, a couple months, then we really felt, okay, we can have the bandwidth now to reach out into the community. Um, but in tandem with this, because that was one of our big revenue times, um, we were uh, heavily, um, heavily uh, sourced in a lot of food during that time. Um, and then, so we had an abundance of food that we needed to make sure we um, did something with. Uh, because the schools closed around that time as well, we were able to um, take the food to a local food pantry, the share table. We did it in various um, loads to them. Um, and because they saw quite an increase in people utilizing their services, that time was really helpful for us to um, resource that food into the community. Uh, so that was really helpful. And um, our CEO, David Norton, uh, became part of something called the Enchanted Circle COAD, which is Communities Organizing and Acts of Disasters. Um, so it's comprised of various um, entities in the Enchanted Circle here. And uh, so they meet twice a week and try to identify the most urgent need in the community. Uh, and through that, the Taos Community Foundation set up the Fund for Taos, which is an emergency fund that is pushing uh, funds out into the community. So they've raised a little, their goal is to raise about a million dollars. Uh, they've raised a little over a quarter of a million dollars, and they've um, put out into the community about $150,000 um, to uh, respond to those needs. 
what came of that is um, our owner has a foundation uh, called the Towski Valley Foundation. They went ahead and donated $25,000 to that fund. And then have now, uh, we recently announced yesterday that we have another $25,000 matching um, donation uh, for people to contribute so that we're able to continue to build this fund for the Taos community. Uh, along with that, um, you know, we've been on so many webinars, both industry specific through the National Ski Areas Association and Ski Area Management that we've found very, very helpful for our, for our industry. Uh, and uh, now, you know, we've, um, caring for our people and caring for our community, we feel like we have, um, you know, a foundation set for caring for our people, we have a foundation set for caring for our community, and now we're looking at, okay, what is the next step with business? For us, um, we were, you know, it was toward the tail end of our season, and typically, you know, April and May are quiet times for us. It allows us to transition from winter to summer operations. So um, this has been kind of a typical lull in the business, uh, but we just started the last week of really looking at different scenarios um, of uh, returning staff to the mountain, what that looks like, how to care for them as they return, uh, what does it look like if we're able to open in some capacity? What happens if we're not able to open at all? So we're really just uh, diving into different scenarios. And like I said, attending as many webinars that are industry specific. So for our hotel, they're you know, sitting in on webinars about um, how different hotels are opening. Um, and honestly, there's kind of some worldwide resources out there now and that's been helpful. Uh, the same thing with restaurants. There's a lot of restaurants, obviously, who are still operating. Um, so really trying to learn as much as we can from kind of the greater global community on, on how we can start thinking about this. Um, certainly what's uh, making sure we're uh, making decisions in tandem with our community, however, um, and that's where that, uh, E, the Enchanted Circle co-ed really has been very helpful um, so that together as a community, we can make decisions versus, you know, one business making a decision to do their own thing. Um, that's been something very helpful for us. So that's what I wanted to share today. Thanks, Don. Um, that's, that's great. Uh, let's let's follow along and then we can open again for you know more specific questions. But Johanna, do you want to get on this? Sure. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, thanks for having me. It's it's great to be here amidst this this really thoughtful panel. It's it's an honor. Um, and I'm thankful to UNM Anderson and uh, Garima and uh, Wellington for hosting this discussion. Um, it, it's exciting to be talking about solutions and, and recovery. I think for the past six weeks or so, um, I and a lot of other people have been immersed in a pretty dark place. We've, I know in, in the economic development department for the state, we've been getting a lot of calls daily, almost in the hundreds uh, from folks uh, that are really scared, they're mad, they're hurting. Um, and, and I'm so thankful for the ability to, to talk about uh, positive things and, and look forward and plan for, for good um, that can come in the future. So thankful for that. Um, I wanted to give really briefly before we get into it, a little brief insight into uh, my background and because and, uh, I think it's, it's relevant. But um, I started a business way, way back. Um, I had gotten involved in, in the recycled textile industry. Um, and at that time I was living in West Texas, close to the border um, in this area that uh, uh, it, near Marfa, if anyone knows where that is. So a lot of, it, celebrities and style conscious people were there and um, fancy parties, but as well as uh, kind of environmentally conscious people, tourists 
go to there and there wasn't a place to um, buy clothing or camping gear. Um, and so I started a, a like a clothing kind of catch all business, nothing revelatory in, in the business model, but it did fulfill a need. And, and I think the day I started the next day, the recession hit. So um, very, very similar um, feelings and, and reverberations uh, occurred then around the recession then you know, similar to what's happening now, um, you could you could literally shoot a, a cannonball down Main Street and not hit anyone. Um, and so I know at that point, I, I in order to survive, I had to get really creative, um, figure out how to kind of reassess how I was how I was doing business. I know we we switched to um, letting customers they could they could sell things to us or they could trade things. We um, started selling online. Um, and so those lessons that we learned during that period, uh, I've taken with me even until now. Um, I, in fact, I, I moved and, and started an online business that I still have today. That's why my background is so messy. This is the only quiet room in my home and this is my, my business storeroom. So I apologize about the messy background. I need to learn how to do the, the cool backgrounds. But um, those lessons that, that were learned during that recession time have strengthened the business that, that I have now. And it was an opportunity to grow and to learn. And, and I know currently uh, with the business that I have, I, I'm not even able to keep up with the sales that, that I have. Um, so I, I think the time that we're in, it, it's not a time for stubbornness. It's not a time for, for rage, for anger. As entrepreneurs, I don't think that there's, there's time for that. It, it's a waste of energy. This is a time, I think, for attunement, uh, for sensitivity, for empathy, uh, for respect. And um, our customers are, are scared. This is a very raw time. And, and as business owners, we have to take a, a leadership role and, and confront these, these issues moving forward. I know um, when, when I first heard about this, this session in the work word pivot I, I got a little bit stuck because I, I immediately thought about the the, the basketball move um, basketball's big in, in our household and and I know that um, you know if you're you're thinking about basketball and you're you're pressing down the court um, and all of a sudden this like big six ten guy 300 pounds steps in front of you you have to stop um, and you pass or you make a shot. And, and in that case, uh, applying it to kind of where we're all at right now, I, I get stuck with this idea that you have to stop. Um, Cause I think right now, you know, maybe even a better analogy is like, I, I really like soccer. So an, another analogy is this idea where you're going down the, the field and there's this move in soccer that, that I've always known it as, um, like a tornado twist and you get the ball and you flip it over the defender and you use that momentum and you keep going, you keep charging toward the goal. Cause I think that as, as business owners, if, if we stop right now, if, if we, you know, dwell on things, if we stagnate, we're, we're not going to survive. You're, you're not going to get to the next phase. Um, so that attitude is more what we need to, to have to get us through this. Um, and then we know that that any significant change that we're going to have to um, incorporate into our business models right now, it, it requires intense inflection. Um, business is, is always full of disruptions. We as entrepreneurs are used to that. We, we expect them. Um, but right now, it, it's more so, it, it's so incredibly important to, to figure out and recalculate our position, figure out where we fit in into this market right now. Um, we, we already do that, you know, we already do that. But um, because things have changed so quickly in such a short period of time, I think um, due to instability, to anxiety, uh, the personal traumas that that people are are experiencing. This is a time for business owners that that we have to step up and, and be really attuned to those needs of of what's going on with our customers. So um, I know I've always subscribed to the thinking that to be successful 
you really have to know your customers better than themselves. You have to know their, their feelings intimately. And right now, I think being aware of, of the psychology and what's happening to their families, to the communities, um, knowing their concerns, their fears is absolutely necessary. And, and this information is going to be what's informing uh, business shifts and in, in your pivots or, or your tornado twists or um, whatever you want to call it. Um, because that's going to, to be your survival in the next phase. So um, I, I know an example is, um, you know, when, you, when we do look out, outside and we see all the, the incredible emotions and lost income and, and loneliness that we're seeing, people are looking for ways to connect with each other. They're looking for authenticity, for purpose, and, and they're looking for ways to help. And, and where we find ourselves um, at this, this, this point is, is the ability to create ways in which we can engage and, and fulfill those needs while they're consuming. And, and so I think that as social entrepreneurs or, or someone that subscribes to this B Corp mentality, this, this is really an exciting time for us. We're talking about creating um, another level of, of, of consciousness within um, business models and, and improving the ways that we do business. Um, we're talking about creating models that, that essentially can care and protect and, and listen and collaborate and, and, and support the community during, during a time of need. So, um, you know, and I, I think we, we all take that with a grain of salt at the same time. We're, we're treading lightly. We saw what happened to the, um, if you read the story about the hand sanitizer guys, um, they bought all the hand sanitizers and, and we're trying to sell that for exorbitant amounts. So um, any acts of in, in office, in authenticity um, is, is going to be obvious. And, and so um, people, I don't think, are going to want to see the old ways of doing business. So I, I think it's good. We, these are all the, the good, positive things we get to dive into now and, and explore and blow them open. Um, and, and just kind of wrapping up some, some key takeaways, um, you know, if we look at it as kind of steps, like the first one as a business, you're reflecting, you're assessing where you're at, you're, you're identifying those uncomfortable things of, of your financial needs, your capacity, um, your problems, your challenges. Um, the second step, you're, you're exploring, you're discovering, you're listening to your customers, you're identifying what is it that they, they need during this, this, this crisis period. Um, the third step is where you're really getting into how you're, you're developing your, your new model. How do you answer the customer's needs? Um, what are the opportunities that you can expand and build upon? And, um, you know, those are the, the, the traditional areas that, that I think everyone is familiar with about, um, you know, exploring. Is it your delivery? Is it the way that you're delivering your, delivering your product? Can you go online? Um, you know, what are, what are the ways you can prove your delivery? Is it your communication? Is there something in, in your story and in, in your promotion you can improve upon? Um, is it your price? Can, can you offer a, a, a different price? Um, is it your product? Can you improve? Can you innovate on what you're offering? Um, and, and how can you do these when you're, you're going above and beyond um, so you can make people feel comfortable? And, and I think the final step to take away or to wrap it up with is, after you've done that and you've identified how you can you can really kind of address a new business model is reaching out to the resources that are available right now. So many organizations, UNM Anderson included, New Mexico Good included, are stepping up to offer advice, assistance, um, you know, consulting. There are so many resources and programs out there that are coming online quickly. So it's up to you as an entrepreneur to, to reach out and ask for assistance and ask for help because so many people are willing to help. And, and I think overarching community Communication is such a big part of this. Um, I read an article recently that that a lot of the petition, politicians are just posting um, uh, shots of them doing laundry and cooking uh, meals because um, constituents and people just want to see familiarity and they want to see faces and connect with people. I saw uh, USDA was doing a um, campaign where they were showing people working from home. So people want to connect. They want positivity. So. Um, 
in closing, I, I'm just really hopeful that we can use this time to shift our business models and come out even more conscious toward um, the left out uh, groups, the left out demographics, the environment, and, and solve big time problems. So thank you so much again, and, and please let me know how I can be of any assistance. Our department is ready to go. Um, we're working around the clock to get information out um, and assist how we can. So we want to be a really good partner and especially um, be a part of, of the solutions and the recovery. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Joanna. Uh, this is amazing. I um, appreciate, again, you finding a time to um, squeeze one more webinar into your day. Um, so just a reminder to everyone, please uh, feel free to uh, direct your questions to any specific uh, any of our speakers or general questions will be going into a Q and A's later. So um, please, yes, do that. Uh, use that chat button uh, to do that. Uh, Doug, are you? Yeah. Ready? Well, thanks for for inviting me to the webinar. Uh, I want to take a few minutes to talk about some financial strategies that small businesses and business owners might be able to use to navigate themselves through this difficult uh, and challenging time. I'm a registered investment advisor at Longview Asset Management, and I have to give the obligatory disclaimer before we start and just say that any uh, opinions expressed are my own and, and not Longview's, and remind people that I'm, uh, again, a registered investment advisor and I'm not a tax professional. So I'm gonna give some tax advice here briefly, but uh, always check with your, your tax pro before implementing anything, any strategy you hear from a webinar. Um, so there's a lot of things we can talk about. I'm gonna go kind of quickly, hit some high level ideas, and maybe throw out a few creative suggestions that people haven't maybe considered when they're trying to uh, fund their business or keep their businesses in operation uh, as they see the revenues decline. Now, a lot's been already covered on the Paycheck Protection Program, so I won't spend a lot of time on that, but I would like people to remember that, um, of course, the loan is 100% forgiven if you use it for qualified expenses, but if you aren't comfortable doing that for, for a number of reasons, it's still the best small business loan you're ever gonna get. The repayment terms are very, very generous. Um, there's a 1% interest rate. You have six months to defer payments. You get two years to repay it. And so if you're looking for a loan, that really is gonna be your best first shot. Um, but again, if you can use it for, for payroll expenses and keep your employees uh, uh, employed and give them some income, that's your best strategy for doing it. Uh, some things that people might not be aware of is that if you have an existing SBA loan, talk to your lender because the SBA will cover your interest and principal for six months on all of your existing loans. So that's something to, to take advantage of. And if you don't use the PPP, there are a number of payroll tax credits that are very, very generous. They're, they're complicated. I won't go into all the details, but do talk to your CPA or tax professional about those tax credits because the the under the CARES Act, there's there's so many opportunities and uh, ways in which you can can kind of take the edge off of the, the financial crisis that people are going through that you you may be going through. Now, one strategy that's come up a lot that I've talked to clients with is retirement plan loans. So, if you have a qualified retirement plan, such as a 401k, a 403b, or an IRA, um, under the CARES Act, you can now withdraw up to $100,000 from your retirement plan with no penalty so that the standard 10% penalty is waived and you can repay, um, and there's no taxes due for three years. So, and then you can also repay it over a three year period. So if you took 100,000 out of your retirement plan and you were able to pay it back over the next three years and put that money back in, there would be no penalty and no taxes due. So it's a, a really clever and creative way to, to fund some op business operations. But I, I would uh, caution people from using it unless it's really your last absolute resort. Because one of the things to remember is why businesses, why, why the concept of uh, a corporation was invented. So the reason corporations initially were invented was to shield entrepreneurs and investors from the liability that a business might incur. So you really want to try as best you can to keep a really strong firewall between your business expenses and your personal expenses. Because in the worst case scenario that your business needs to go bankrupt, well, that's really quite tragic, but it's not nearly as bad as personal bankruptcy. 
So remember to try to keep that firewall between the two, two entities. Um, and taking a retirement plan loan to fuel your business really does violate that principle. But again, uh, it's, it's a, you know, these are desperate times. So sometimes desperate measures are required, but, but I would um, caution against that if you, if you can avoid it. And then I really want to talk for a minute about what we call zero-based budgeting. So, you know, budgeting through this time is going to be crucial and key to the survival and wellness of any business you may be running. So the way zero-based budgeting works is you start every single period from zero and you question every single expense. You start by examining what's absolutely necessary. What do you have to pay? And then what are flexible or optional expenses? So it's pretty intuitive, and I, probably most people are doing this already, but any payments that you can delay or defer into the future um, until we can get through this pandemic crisis is gonna be your best bet. So if you can ask for forbearance on rent or mortgage, um, if there's any maintenance that you can defer, these are things that really, uh, if you can push them out until your cash flow improves, uh, that would be to your advantage. And also think about if you have an employer match to a retirement plan, those things could all be, be put on hold for a bit. But really the, the, the high level issue is just to remind people that good bookkeeping and organization are gonna be key to surviving this. So don't fly blind, you know, have all your tax documents available and everything laid out because I expect we're gonna see a lot more stimulus coming through Congress. So there's, this is just round one. There's likely to be multiple rounds of stimulus going through. And so you wanna be first in line to be able to apply for those opportunities when they become available. So good bookkeeping is gonna be, be really key. Now, um, to a couple of things with clients to remember that being really transparent in your decision-making process through this is going to be extraordinarily essential that you're communicating well with your employees, you're communicating well with your stakeholders and your clients so that um, there's no surprises and that people really understand where your business is at. But one thing I would suggest for people, one thing, that, one thing we've done at Longview Asset Management that we hadn't really planned on doing right away, but we, we updated was to um, really boost our online presence. We've traditionally been a brick and mortar business. We do most of our business face to face with clients. Uh, we've always had a web presence, but this crisis really was the, the kick in the pants we needed to completely redevelop and redesign our website, launch a strong social media campaign. We felt like there were a lot of things we could forego, but as we, we really see this digital trend is, is here to stay, a lot of people, because of the pandemic is likely to last for a, lot, for a year or more in terms of our social distancing, a lot of these habits that we have are gonna become ingrained. And so uh, building a, a strong digital online presence uh, really is gonna, it already is, it's our present and our future, and it's gonna become more so. So if you can try to pivot and redirect your business as much as you can online, I think that's gonna serve, serve everyone very, very well. And then just a quick things to follow up. Um, you know, this is really, in times of disruption, it's a great opportunity to take clients away from your competitors who might be really flat-footed right now. So, and the theme of this webinar, to pivot, the faster and harder you can pivot and up your game to, to uh, capture the, an opportunity, as, as unfortunate as it may be, and really, you know, strengthen your existing client relationships, go above and beyond when communicating with clients, and then uh, being able to sort of reach out to various networks and build your business. I think you'll find in this disruptive period, a lot of businesses are not only they're going to go under, but you're also going to find a lot of ways in which you could actually increase your business opportunities. And I'll, I'll, I'll just wrap up with a couple quick examples. Um, we've worked with two nonprofits. One is provides in-home care for new moms and infants, and their whole business model was shut down because of quarantining. They could no longer go into their clients' homes, and they pivoted themselves to being an emergency response team, providing emergency services for moms and newborn babies, uh, providing food, rent assistance, uh, diapers, formula, things that people now are suddenly lacking, and they've doubled their budget in just the past few months in terms of both fundraising and in terms of grant writing, um, they've been able to really make that hard pivot and go from a high touch service to being a high tech service. And that really served them well. We have another example for a, a Buddhist retreat center 
that we're close with, they had a, a summer retreat planned and there could usually hold maybe 30 or so participants for that event. They shifted it to an online format. They now have 600 people participating around the world. So they, they didn't expect these, these opportunities to come, but they really have been able to grow their business. Um, and, and we've seen that as well with our practice. So there are opportunities out there if you can make that hard pivot and shift and, and take advantage of, of whatever things come your way. And I'd be happy to dig deeper into any of those areas we discussed uh, as time permits and questions arise. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. That, that was great. Yes, uh, by all means, we're going to circulate this back to everyone and all the resources that we have will be included in that. So, um, yes, I'm looking forward to gather as much as possible. Um, Drew, are you with us? I am with you. <laughs> awesome. So, Drew, you want to take it away? Um, I think you got the idea. We're just uh, going over each of your topics and then we're going to come back to you with more specific questions. So by all means. Yeah. Thank, um, thank you, Wellington, Agarima, UNM, and then also all the B Corp folks and all of you for taking time on a Friday afternoon. Um, I strategically placed myself in my room and then the sun moved. So um, I may do some fun little contortions here. Um, I posted a couple of things in our chat since people are being chatty. I did want to uh, share some fun things that I thought would be good to look at. Um, checking in with Wellington and Garima, can I share a screen? Is that going to work? And will that be all right? Yes, that should work, Drew. Okay, then let's see if I can do that successfully. Um, let me just give you a couple of opening comments. Uh, and what I wanted to do is, first of all, mention B Corps. A lot of us on the call came together around that, and then the excellent UNM effort for New Mexico for Good. And I hope that our organizers will do some shameless plugs for that as we try to grow a new idea who, whose time is come and, and it's even more timely now than before, where we can work together for local living economies. And I was trying to think about what I could contribute to this conversation and so wanted to give you three different uh, components that I feel go together, at least in my brain. One is how do we be successful given the economic challenges and giving the news, uh, particularly the doom and gloom that news likes to use to sell its product. Um, so that's number one. Number two, what are some tips and tricks that any of us can do as small business owners in government, in nonprofits uh, to economically strengthen or lengthen some of our current situations, which for some people are very, very severe. Uh, and then the third is what are some resources that we can draw upon both now and going into the future um, as we come out of some hibernation and get into engaging with each other and more economic development again. So that's what I was thinking about. Um, would love to have comments be typed in here. Our hosts can shout out some questions and then we can get to a little bit of dialogue since all of my other uh, fellow talk speakers have been very good about brevity and I'd like to emulate that. So uh, on the first one, relationships, community, there's a micro and a macro, right? There's day-to-day -day actions where we're each engaging with other people, even if it's more virtual than uh, reality or in person now. And then there's an ecosystem or a holistic perspective. And uh, I wanted to think about the fact that today is May 1st, right? The International Day of the Worker, which is a, a very revered day throughout most of the world, uh, a little less so in America, we reserve it for Memorial Day, uh, but or Labor Day. But for us to think about how great that we're doing this time and we're all coming together, a hundred of us are coming together to think about these issues. And it's really our workers, both those on the front line who are our grocery store folks, giving us food, providing health for us, that are doing the most severe and dangerous work in our society today. But then also the fact that companies are made up of people, of workers, and you don't have a company or a nonprofit as just a disembodied entity uh, in a vacuum, no matter what our Supreme Court has chosen to identify uh, co corporations as entities. So uh, when I think about that, it makes me think about how do we cooperate 
what else can we be doing for collective action, for cooperatives, and my new favorite word, which I might mispronounce, coopetition, right? Who is an entity that you might have before thought of as a competitor or against you, but now in our current environment where we all need to survive, we really have more in common than we might have thought. And there are new channels where we each can bring something to the metaphorical stone soup party and each provide something that is additive and helpful in helping our business or our nonprofit survive economically, but also in serving and being in service to others. So I believe that that is a fundamental purpose of this community and what I would invite all of you to be a part of is to think about what do you have to offer, what do you need and what do you want to ask for? And sometimes just simply the connectivity between other people can create those solutions. Uh, my neighbor is a good seamstress. Um, so she simply offers that she's willing to make masks for her neighbors. Uh, maybe that grows into a commercial activity of creating protective equipment for those she knows or for a medical institution. But even if it doesn't, it's a social service she can provide. It's a minor cost she incurs for herself and it creates a social good. Uh, that's the motivation around B Corp. And now that New Mexico has passed legislation for public benefit corporations, those of us on our call um, and the doubling of B Corp entities in this state that we've been able to observe through entities including Electric White House, which I'm affiliated with, uh, leads to more business for good and using uh, market-based principles for social value. So I really encourage us to think about the micro, how are we just on a day-to-day -day basis helping each other? And then the macro, what's the ecosystem, what's the greater world where we can all help each other to do better? Um, so we have an invitee on this call, Joan Bybee, who I got to meet through uh, an organization called Kivera Coalition, and she's a rancher. Um, she's one of the links that I put in there. Let's see if I can find it. It's the New Mexico local beef. So I'm gonna try to share my screen um, and go to her website real quick. Uh, let's see if I do this successfully, fingers crossed. Um, so you should be able to, let's see here. This is Joan's website. So hopefully you're seeing the Mestenu Draw Cattle Company. And the reason why um, I was so impressed with Joe is because uh, I started just a conversation with some buddies of mine with uh, let's buy locally. And can we buy locally and help our local economy? So that was just a question we came up with. We were doing kind of the happy hour Zoom thing, which a lot of people seem to do. And uh, I was introduced to Joan and Joan has cattle. And she's you know, right next door to us, and it's not her key season right now, but economically, she's been able to send uh, cows to the processors and then directly provide meat to folks who are interested. And she's done so well, and I'm paraphrasing for her, uh, she might have a different perspective, is that uh, she then realized the success and went to other ranchers next door and offered the same thing. And so I went out to the people who I know and said, hey, who would love some great local beef at a price that makes sense for Joan? And I got great response. We're up to 220 pounds of meat that people would love to order from her. And so Joan and I are working together. We haven't done this before, but she's working with her processors. And so a whole value chain ends up getting, you know, not a huge economic bump, but economic activity simply by using social media and human relationships. And I would have never met Joan if it wasn't for the chain of me going to some folks I knew at Kivera Coalition, Kivera recommending Joan, and Joan being able to work and hustle and figure out her system to do this. Uh, and so that has been a really great small example where I think we all should be thinking of what we can do with our neighbors, with our friends, and with others. Uh, so that's just one example. And so with the screen share, I wanted to introduce you to Electric Playhouse, which some of you might know. Uh, we are a provisional B Corp, provisionally certified B Corp or public benefit corporation. And I'm, I'm personally an investor and involved, so I want to disclose that. Um, but this is a, a social company that's trying to continue to be in service as what we call a third place. You have your home, you have your work, 
and then you have community spaces. And in America, uh, the third places with the churches, the bowling leagues, the social ser services and agencies, statistically have decreased by more than 50%. And so as we look at strip malls and our malls being a challenge time, both with Amazon and less shopping before this, and even magnified more with uh, the COVID situation, how do we help our community have places they can safely gather, be, and enjoy? Uh, and Electra Playhouse is working towards that solution. Um, this is the Facebook with a lot of fun things to share. Um, and what Electra Playhouse is doing right now, because it's not receiving uh, the general public, as you can imagine, is it started a YouTube channel. And this is free, and we've created what we call community sessions. And so the purpose is to have fun, create some education, and some entertainment. Um, so you can see here our chef, Julian, uh, who has trained people in food service. And we've partnered with New Mexico United, another beloved local brand that sadly isn't able to serve uh, our community because of health concerns. And so we partnered with them and our chef is teaching his kid to make a, a stadium pretzel. And then we had the players with their kids also make stadium pretzels at their home. So, you know, it's silly. Um, does it create value for the world? Maybe not, but we want it to be educational. We want it to be uh, something that you could do as a family or with other people. We wanted it to be something that everyone could share and almost anyone could do at home, pretty basic ingredients. Uh, and it's a way for us to communicate. And to me, that's just a perfect example of how we do create a social good with a business here. Uh, we're also a partner with Marble Brewery. And so they were sharing expertise of how you uh, make beer and uh, what it is the perspective of beer making from the experts who make it. So that's something fun you can check out. Um, my shameless plug is if you wanna be a subscriber to our YouTube channel, we're trying to get to a hundred folks uh, and that's free. So shameless plug there. Um, and then other things I was thinking about in terms of capital and financing is um, we, uh, I've been part of consulting activity through Upspring, which was called Social Enterprise Associates. And we wanted to create a lot of social uh, uh, available resources through our consulting activities. And so we have a number of resources here at Upspring Associates slash resources where we have some short tip sheets uh, with some nonprofit social enterprise and, and triple bottom line business efforts. We have some emerging topics. And uh, where my mind went to when I was asked to share some thinking here is I went to some um, topics that I've talked about in the past where I was invited to do a TEDx talk uh, which I'm now fruitfully scrolling for because I can't uh, possibly multitask. Uh, and then I also got to do something called the Santa Fe Art Institute 140 on uh, the history of immigrants and helping uh, in economic and helping start businesses. And, you know, my family is an immigrant family. We came through Ellis Island. And our story was borrowing from other people from the same communities to put my great-grandfather in business uh, he was put into a candy store, kind of corner store, um, what do you call it, publishers, right? We could go and buy newspapers. Uh, and so this was just a corner business. This was his first gig off the boat, proverbial boat. He had uh, a wife, he had a young kid, and the community put him in, in business. And no bank was going to help him, but it's everyone uh, lending to each other and the chain of trust. And so that's still possible today with friends and family. And then uh, Teresa had a, one of the comments in there about micro lenders. I'm on the board of West, which is a, a small business support organization, which also has a loan fund. And so you do have institutions in our community that are available to help our for-profit and our nonprofit businesses. The small business development centers, DreamSpring, the loan fund, there's quite a number of them. And so asking for help is difficult and um, sometimes uh, orgullo, you say in Spanish, so honor or pride, but being able to ask for assistance for new things in this challenging time is another way uh, to seek opportunity and again, a way for the community or other ways to offer services. So another offshoot of the immigrant experience in today's modern social media society is uh, crowdfunding and for capital sources that could be a place to either sell a product through the proverbial Kickstarter or uh, WeFunder or another channel or to seek investment. Um, and as you think about your capital needs,
to be able to run a business. There are a number of ways, so going to friends and family, going to these online channels, having a positive relationship with a bank, even though a lot of people have negative stories right now with the PPP and the SBA emergency relief. Uh, but how do you overcome those? You create a relationship. You go meet a banker or you call and establish a relationship with a banker. Um, and so that brings me back full circle with um, we need to take care of our dollars and cents in our bottom line. Um, and it's a very real economic need, but finding other people to do business with, uh, both banks, credit unions, people to buy, sell, uh, your vendors, your suppliers, and us all working together for everyone doing a little bit and taking a little bit of pain, hopefully we can all get through this together. And I think with that, um, I'll wrap up my comments, just hoping that we can all do things to share a healthy ecosystem. So let me stop sharing my screen, turn it back to our organizers, and then answer any questions uh, by email or in our conversation. And again, thanks to everyone for sharing a fun time this Friday afternoon. Thanks, thanks. Appreciate that, Drew. Um, awesome resources. So uh, now is probably the time where we open for questions, although we have many already in the, the chat. Um, Garima, do you want to uh, grab a couple of specific ones? Sure, no, I want to thank, again, I want to thank all the speakers, just such concrete and at the same time inspiring comments. So thank you for that. And I've been monitoring the chat. Great, great set of resources. We're going to um, copy the chat and circulate it amongst the attendees. Um, so don't worry if you're not sort of keeping up with every, uh, the great um, source of information there. Um, maybe we can start with one of the questions. It was really not a question, but more of a comment, but I would personally love to hear your perspectives. So uh, it's how can we really move forward to, toward a future that is authentic to our own vision? And I will add to that sort of what is each of your organizations or yourself as a leader concretely doing to move toward a desirable future? And I would even ask you, how do you know what's a desirable future? Johanna, since you had to um, leave us <laughs> earlier than usual, do you want to start? Sure. And, and the question is getting at what amidst everything, how do we, what is our view for a desirable future? How do we know what's our desirable future and how can we move toward it? So maybe an example from each of your organizations or yourself, how do you understand or what is a desirable future and how do you move toward it? Well, I, I think that during this crisis, what we're seeing and hearing is the, the challenges that are occurring, I think are just highlighting problems and challenges that existed before the crisis. So folks that are experiencing difficulty getting a loan, maybe because they're, they're low income, they're in a rural area, they're, they're an, an, a person of color. Um, these challenges are just even more exaggerated in this crisis. So we're able to, I would hope, see the challenges, see what's, exi what's happening right now, and, and be able to address them, be able to, to figure out, okay, how do, we, how do we get capital out into these underserved markets? Um, what are programs that, that we can create that help address these issues? Um, and I think that that's getting us to a point that that is improved, that that's helping um, uh, alleviate some of those problems. And and I think that that all the speakers and panelists did a really good job about talking about um, how big of a role communication is is playing. Um, you know, we I, I'm seeing in the chat we're all trying to share resources right now and. It, everyone has a different perspective and, and has a different channel of information. And, and I think that that is going to, to be able to improve our, our future if we're able to collaborate like this and, and share ideas. The more, the more ideas and more perspectives, I think the better. So I'm hopeful that, that all of this will inform um, our solutions for, for a good recovery and a good future. 
Wonderful, thank you. Anybody else? Um, Don, Drew, Doug, do you have any comments on that? How do you know what's the desirable future and how would you move toward it? First, like in your organizations, how are you doing making that journey? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to jump in on that. So I think a desirable future obviously is one where we have a sustainable economy and a sustainable planet. So climate change is a huge issue that we're gonna, it's our next uh, environmental, cha biological challenge essentially after we get through the COVID crisis. So uh, building a sustainable economy is certainly a desirable future for us. Uh, the way we've addressed that in part is becoming a B Corp. And then um, also uh, focusing exclusively on environmentally and socially responsible investing. So we no longer take new clients if they aren't committed to protecting our planet and protecting our communities. So we've really made, made a, a really hard stance on that and we're really proud about it. Uh, and then the exciting thing that we've also discovered is that um, environmentally and socially responsible investing is competitive to or in many ways superior to conventional investing. So it's in all of our best interests, not just to um, put these, these social justice issues, we often frame them in a moral context, but it's also, I think, helpful what we've been doing, trying to be a thought leader in this space, and many, many others are doing it, but we, we've really tried to, to get out in front of it, is to argue that environmental and social con justice concerns are materially relevant, and that's an important term, they're materially relevant to the performance of a portfolio. So things like, um, you know, oil, we've seen, we've seen huge issues with that lately. So um, as well as things like climate change, how, how are these environmental practices going to impact business models and the sustainability of corporations moving forward? How sustainable is their business model? So, so that's something we've taken a, a good hard look at. And, uh, you know, so, so I think that's a, maybe the most succinct answer I can give to your question. Thank you. Let's see, I got a couple thoughts. Um, number one is I think that there are some great New Mexico businesses that are doing excellent work that began before the COVID situation and their products are even more valuable for us today the, and the community. So um, Edie Dillman's on the call and her company is Be Public, so Be Public Inc. And they are looking to build a better, greener house. Um, and so Edie might uh, give a little bit of more of a shameless plug there. But, you know, if we think about our climate world, uh, particularly New Mexico, which is so oil and gas dependent, um, and that COVID probably did more to help reduce our climate situation than anything anyone has done politically in the last 20 years, that companies like what Be Public is doing are imperative. And so any of us where we are gonna spend money, particularly less money than we might have had or might have wanted to spend before, spending that money every dollar in a very valuable way that's gonna to lead to a local economy, that's going to lead to a more of the world we wanna see, that's incredibly valuable. So uh, we all have control over that. Uh, are you gonna buy food at uh, the co-op instead of from Albertsons? It might be more expensive. Uh, it might not have exactly what you want, but what does that do for our local economy, our local uh, food system, our local suppliers? So that's number one. Uh, number two, there's some other bright spots in our economy through technology. Uh, one of the resources I listed was uh, Build With Robots. And this is a company that was doing what they call co-botting. So you take a robot and you have it work alongside a human. So it's not trying to replace human beings. And they had something called a paint bot. Imagine a really intense paint environment where there's a lot of fumes, it's dirty, it's dangerous for humans. And so you want to use a robot with a human for that. And so they took their paint bots and they are adapting them to be clean bots to be able to help large public spaces, an airport, a school, to be able to clean and every morning be able to tell people, you have a safe environment that is not going to put you at risk for being sick. Um, and so this is a great New Mexico company. They just raised some money. They're gonna hire, which in our current environment is a welcome thing. And they've committed to being part of New Mexico. So, you know, what are you doing with your money? What are the businesses that are doing? Are they behaving in ways that helps our community? And can we have companies that are in New Mexico that are providing safety to make a better world for us? So those are the things that occur to me with your question, Karima. Thank you. Don, do you have any comments? 
Yeah, so I think um, to kind of hit on a little bit about what the other speakers spoke about, you know, one thing is really looking at um, how we move forward in a really deliberate way in ways that benefit ourselves locally, right? Um, I, there are a few folks um, from the house community that are on the on this and uh, I feel like what we've done um, with the co-ed and, and the relationships we've built uh, up to this point are really serving us well now. And things like we have a couple of local companies um, who have moved to uh, making sanitizer, right? One of the things that are in, in uh, high demand and low quantities throughout, throughout the entire supply chain. So how is it that we can connect with them as we um, think about reopening and what this looks like? Um, you know, one idea is amenity bags, both for our staff and, and hopefully for our guests in the future that contain things like um, a locally made hand sanitizer. We have this amazing woman who um, is, is an amazing fiber artist. Um, and she and her daughter have been making masks with some of this beautiful material she's made um, for uh, the community and healthcare workers, et cetera. And, um, you know, connecting with her and asking um, for masks for each of our staff and guests. And so it's ways of really reconnecting with the community, similar to what Drew brought up with um, the local beef, right, of really reaching into the community, finding out what the resources are, and then building and connecting with those um, through your business. And I think that's something that will serve us really well um, uh, going forward so that these massive supply chains that we've seen um, start to become more localized and that that thriving, uh, that thriving community can happen with, within New Mexico. I, I think a way to kind of lead forward is, um, you know, for us, it's really living our B Corp ethos. And um, we really, this is what served us thus far in this crisis of really focusing on caring for our people, caring for our community and caring for our business. And, and when you lead with the, those ethos and, and that ethos and those values, I think that's gonna carry your business far. And so I would highly encourage everyone to really focus on what are your business ethos and how do you live those um, in this really important time in a crisis, that those that those will carry you forward. That's fantastic. Uh, thank you for that, Don. Um, I also saw uh, some interaction in our chat function around the benefit corporation legislation that was recently passed uh, in New Mexico, and so uh, there may be folks on the call who are interested in having uh, more of that information. So uh, Glenn, I'm gonna unmute you if you want to take just a minute to share about all the hard work that you've done. Um, and um, just if you can, actually it's not allowing me to unmute, but you should be able to unmute yourself. So if you were able to do that, Glenn, it would be great to hear about all your hard work and successes and maybe give like a few minutes of what is the legislation and got passed and the difference between the legislation and the certification. What hard work. That seven years went by so quickly. I, um, yeah, it, it was a long haul, but we did get it passed this year with the help of many of you that are on this call. Um, certainly everybody at UNM and Don and Drew and John Mertz and everybody who's got there, I'm sure I forgot somebody um, that showed up, Carrie and Meow Wolf both were there to help out. And it's, um, it, as I said, it's been seven years from the time that we first got it passed through the House and the Senate, and then it was pocket vetoed. And um, Speaker Egolf was very uh, anxious to help out this time around and we were able to get it on the governor's call and it was uh, it was a bipartisan supported bill and we had a lot of help along the way and yeah now if you are a corporation and or forming a corporation you can be a designated benefit corporation in the state of New Mexico. Fantastic. Well, thank you for all your hard work. And this is really a great achievement um, for the state. So thank you. Um, 
I'm going to ask uh, another question that John Mertz asked, who's obviously been a great supporter, amazing thinker. You know, a lot of this is a sort of his efforts uh, as equally as ours. So um, John asks, how do you see public and private sectors working together for recovery or restart efforts? So how do you see those collaborations? Um, I'll, I'll jump in. You know, I think this is an awesome example of how we do that, right? I mean, we have the University of New Mexico um, participating in this. Um, we have economic development participating in this. And then we have private businesses uh, participating in this. And I really feel like that collaboration is so needed, um, certainly in New Mexico, but in the world. And, and I think whenever we have opportunities to come together, uh, similar to what Johanna had had said earlier, right, these types of collaborations really make every, make it all just go much better and much more smoothly. So I think, you know, having those deliberate collaborations um, and, and dedicating the time to those, because it's not always easy um, to dedicate your time to, the, to that collaboration, but it's so well worth the effort. We have amazing um, examples of that in our state. Uh, the Rio Grande Water Fund, which is uh, the Nature Conservancy's effort to help make sure uh, that the forests in northern New Mexico are cared for to help make sure there's water for downstream users. Um, that is an incredible public-private um, partnership that has done amazing work in our state. So I think any chance that anybody listening can uh, begin to collaborate both publicly and privately on, on any type of thing, um, I think we're all served better by that. Thank you, John. Anyone else? Well, Karima, I can share something that I'm wondering about that I don't have an answer for. Uh, but in this effort of collective well-being and collective action, uh, how can all of us on this call find channels to media? Uh, because I am tired of the negative media messaging because that's feel how they feel they sell themselves. And our local radio is providing a very valuable resource. We have excellent local stations um, our local papers try very, very hard. And so anyone on this call who does have access to our local media folks, I think that would be a wonderful way for a collective action from this group carrying forward, where we can share those success stories, where we can share these ideas. Um, and so that would be something that I would suggest and volunteer you know, my time for collective action. Um, also, if people are inspired from this, if they want to email Greenland Wellington afterwards, with ideas of us doing either this into a series or um, other ways that we can have just connectivity. So that would um, feel like a way that we can keep living into the future and be relevant. And it's, this isn't just you know, a one shot effort of feeling good. Wonderful. Thank you, Drew. Doug, Johanna, do you have any uh, thoughts on this? What public um, private collaboration? I think he, she left. Maybe oh no, of... I'm still here. Oh, I did, I'm watching, I have GoToWebinar <laughs> up on my screen, so I'm watching when they, they joined. So um, uh, I, I think this is a fantastic question and, and immediately my mind goes to uh, more the, on the development finance side because um, I, I think just immediately I, I deal with a lot of um, uh, collaboration around financial resources and what you see is, and I, I've been watching the chat, I think it was Anne and Christina that brought it up, was um, money, especially through the CARES Act, is coming from the federal administration. And so what are we doing to be able to strategize and, and be able to take advantage of, of the money? Um, how do we collaborate on that? Um, so what I see is, you know, we have these agencies, EDA, USDA, HUD, we're about to get these big tranches of money. So how do we effectively deploy that into the communities that need it? And so 
when I look to the, the public or the private sector, it's intrinsic on them or, or it, it's necessary for them to, to really be communicative about um, needs that they have, to be ready to go with ideas that they have um, for this money that's going to be coming down line in, in the next couple of weeks. So just maintaining that communication is, is just, it's, it's huge. So that's reaching, reaching out to your local governments, reaching out to your, your council of governments, your COGS. They're going to be the ones that are handling uh, the, the EDA money so that we can leverage those pots of money. That's also working with the investment uh, impact investors, the philanthropic groups, the foundations. Um, we do have, have that group fund it. And I'm really excited about fund it because that's where you bring all of the funding agencies to one table so we can brainstorm about how to fund projects um, that are in the public sector. So um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to, to improving that platform and, and be able to respond to the recovery. But um, to answer your question, I, I know I'm kind of babbling on, uh, it's, it's a topic that's really um, important, I think, but um, that communication is just incredibly important. How do we collaborate about um, getting our hands on this money. And one more plug, please fill out your census um, because that uh, uh, determines how much money uh, New Mexico can get from these agencies. Hope that helps. Yeah, that was uh, great. Thank you. Question. Yeah, I do have one more for you. I wanted to give Doug a chance to respond and I hope you stick with us for a few more minutes. But Doug, do you have any uh, reactions to um, the question? Yeah, I'll just very quickly add that I think, you know, the government obviously has put our economy into a medically induced coma. And so it's really gonna be up to the government in part to provide the more, I think we're gonna need much more stimulus. I think we've just seen the tip of it. I think there's a lot more needs to happen. It's not a bad start. It's flawed in a thousand different ways which we could critique, but at least they're doing something. And I think a lot more needs to be done. Now, there's the, the balance between getting it out quickly and getting it out effectively and those two, uh, are, are two levers that are somewhat incompatible, but getting it out there faster is better than get, not getting it out there at all. So um, yeah, that's, this, that's a, just a simple answer to, to a very, very complicated question. Um, I wish I could, we could maybe, that's probably a whole webinar right into itself is how do we leverage the government effectively to, to tackle particularly all those issues that are near and dear to us B Corp folks, but uh, I'll just leave it at that. Let's follow up on that, Doug. Let's mm -hmm. have a, um... A, f a follow up conversation. Yeah, I mean, it's a public policy. I mean, that's the real question: is what pu what's our public policy going to be uh, towards this money and, and towards our communities? And you know, again, now that, that's that's a huge. It, it's just an insurmountably large problem. The, the happy hour version of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you both. So you know, obviously, technology and online presence um, is you know, sort of the advice and a necessity for uh, most businesses right now. So there was a question in the chat box asking, how can the business development resources in New Mexico help local business build their knowledge and skills about online presence? So Johanna, do you wanna start? Sure, and just to repeat the question, it, it's about how can we um, pull resources that we can develop um, technical assistance. Online presence. Uh, online presence, technical assistance. Mm -hmm. um, this is, this is a, a point that, that I'm happy to see raised here, and I've been seeing it raised in a couple of different organizations. It was mentioned, I, I think Drew uh, mentioned it earlier about um, test the SBDC's score, um, uh, the South Valley Economic Development Center, some of the philanthropic groups have really stepped up to offer technical assistance, Main Street, New Mexico Main Street. And so there's been a lot of discussion specifically in SBD, small development center as well as New Mexico Main Street. And I believe in uh, New Mexico tourism to specifically deploy um, their hire people and deploy programs around um, strengthening and developing uh, online uh, capacity for businesses, but that's one small drop in the bucket. I mean, SBDCs do a job, but the reality is, um, you know, only a fraction of the population knows about them. Um, so it, it it does take this collaboration of uh, giving getting the information and in, in the uh, development 
resources out there to rural areas, tribal entities. Um, so we, we need to work more on that, definitely. And, and I will throw in there the money that is coming down from the, the feds, um, specifically through HUD, through EDA, through USDA, that money can be used by um, public bodies and communities to deploy um, entrepreneurial training programs, as well as uh, a technical assistant. So essentially, um, you know, entities could use that money to, to develop um, training if they needed to. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Doug, Drew, Don, do you have any, uh, have you seen any examples of your own business where you've really tapped into a resource to further build your online presence that others can learn from? Sure. I mean, we just, we're right in the middle of it. And um, so we, you know, we're fortunate enough to have, you know, a little bit of cash reserves. We decided to deploy very strategically towards building our online pre presence. We felt like that was the best use of our capital right now. Um, so we, we've just hired a, a web development team to, we've just, we just finished our onboarding process with them. Uh, you know, it's going to be about 45 days to get the whole thing up and running, so maybe two months or more. But, um, but we feel like that's going to position us well in, in, our, in our market space. We've been kind of wanting to do it, but this really pushed us over, the, over to the decision-making process to, to go faster. And then we also launched a social media campaign. We hired a social media coordinator um, to, you know, a part-time position to basically handle all that for us and, and guide, our, guide us. So, but you know, that takes some money and that's hard to do when you're strapped for cash. So one, some, some bootstrap ideas you might think about is talk to, you know, talk to your kids and your grandkids, talk to people. There's a lot of unemployed people out there sitting around in front of their computers with looking for something to do. So, um, you know, a lot of that talent pool is, is pretty deep and pretty wide. So you could very inexpensively, I think, find someone in your social circle uh, who could help you if you know nothing about, you know, to kind of take the lead for a small business and start, start a social media campaign, get your Facebook really revved up, um, and then really, you know, kind of try to enhance your website. So they don't have to be expensive. Obviously, the larger your, your corporation or your firm, the more you want to be uh, really mindful about doing it, um, uh, putting more money behind it. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to look... Uh, shoestring, but at the same time, you, you can get a very high quality product out there on a very limited budget. So it's, it's worth your time that we're just to be mindful of the fact that we're all sitting in front of our computers all day, and that's going to be the reality moving forward. So how do you, how do you leverage that for your business? Wonderful. Thank you, Doug. Drew, I see you unmuted. Do you have any um, ideas? Um, I would probably reiterate what my colleagues have said. Uh, the things that popped into my mind is uh, Google. Um, I think Google and Facebook both have social media grants, particularly to nonprofits and community organizations, uh, because they do want to have a presence here in New Mexico. I, I don't, I'm not finding their link right away, but um, particularly those of us doing community work, that would be something to do. It's very easy for them to provide a free and a penny. And then uh, I agreed with Doug that you do need to spend some money, but um, having somebody help you with social media, if that's not your strength, it's certainly not mine. Uh, you can do it affordably or look at uh, some sort of barter. And certainly the cost of advertising is very inexpensive, particularly if you're very focused, which you should be, and very honed. So you can do some of the social media activity very inexpensively um, and if you get the right resource. So that occurs to me. Um, and then the other uh, piece was uh, somebody had posted about UNM and alum graduates, right? We've going to have a population of young people who are graduating. Um, it's going to be a little bit anticlimactic of a graduation, right? Because they're not going to get the pop and circumstance. But gosh, it would be great if we could find them uh, meaningful work. And I think uh, anything we can do as a community, again, to circulate opportunities, even if it's 1099, you know, independent workers, uh, I think AmeriCorps and VISTA, the Domestic Peace Corps, will be a great opportunity for us to help our local communities. So I think us networking for that. Um, and then um, Grima and Wellington, I can't sign you up for more work, but it sounds like some of the comments that there's willingness to do more conversation. Yeah, no, the, yeah, I've been monitoring the chat as well and just some great ideas about follow-up dialogue. And I mean, 
Friday afternoon and 100 people joined us. So that's fantastic. You know, there is really uh, power in dialogue. So definitely up for doing more. Um, Don, do you have any um, ideas on either what Towski Valley may, may have done or you've heard of other examples of boosting online presence? No, I mean, I, I can just speak from our experience. You know, we really uh, pivoted. If you check out our website, skitaus.com, we've listed all the ways we've been helping community. So um, it's just one way we've been pivoting. Um, I know on our social media presence, um, our social media folks have been really focusing on doing um, uh, uh, like, um, oh, I'm forgetting the word, like polls. So ways to engage people in a way that um, keeps the information, like, like trying to um, know that people are sitting there in front of their computers or they're on their phones, you know, much throughout the day. So how do you engage them? Um, this is not my, uh, in my wheelhouse really. So I know that, uh, you know, Johanna had mentioned that the Department of Tourism in New Mexico um, has some resources. And I know, um, again, reaching out into your community, there are probably people out there like um, the other folks have mentioned, Doug and uh, Drew have mentioned, um, who may just be sitting around who are very willing to give, to give some help. So um, I know like at UNM Taos, there's a digital media program. Um, and so, you know, look at, look at what the resources are in your com community and try to tap into those during this time. That's fantastic. Um, I want to give, I know Craig White, uh, who's uh, you know faculty member at Anderson, he's with us. Craig recently, I'm sorry about that. Craig recently did a um, great webinar sort of listing resources for financial and otherwise for uh, local uh, New Mexico businesses. So Craig, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself if you're still there. Would you like to share anything before we wrap up? Uh, thanks, Karima and Wellington. Thanks to all the speakers. This has been great. Yeah, this, this is Craig White, Professor of Accounting at the University of New Mexico. Uh, as Karima mentioned last week, I did a, a webinar for Innovation Academy, you know, the nature of uh, sharing resources. And uh, possibly maybe we can send the link out if anyone's interested to that. It's been recorded. Uh, what I was doing there is I summarized um, all the provisions in the CARES Act and the Family First uh, relief provisions and uh, put the detail about uh, who they applied to and how to access them. So all those those resources are in that that link and that hopefully uh, provide maybe some further information if that's uh, something of use to you right now. Yeah, that'll be fantastic and we'll be uh, more than happy to circulate it um, to the, all those who have RSVP'd uh, to this webinar. So almost 250 people. So definitely we can do that. Thank you, Greg. Um, I think I'm going to hand it back to Wellington. There was just great set of questions um, and, of course, great comments. And Wellington, do you want to um, close us up? Yes, uh, for sure. Uh, again, thanks, uh, everybody. I mean, this is just uh, this been amazing, as someone mentioned, for a Friday afternoon. <laughs> we have hundreds of people here at one point. So, yeah, we had uh, 250 people registered. So, as Garima said, I'm, we're going to collect all of this, the information in the chats, um, the information that you fill out when you register. There's a question there on the topic uh, that you would like to be discussed. So we're going to collect all of that and other resources too, like the one that Greg just, uh, Craig just mentioned, um, and circulate that to all of those that registered for the uh, webinar. And um, yes, uh, this is uh, well, really insp inspiring and I um, feel much more now, you know, almost obligated to get our New Mexico for good, for a good program uh, going as fast as it can. So um, you'll hear from us. Um, we have some cool things underway already, but um, more to come. And um, I think that's it. Thanks, uh, uh, Don and uh, Johanna, Drew and Doug. It was so um, amazing of you to volunteer and to do this for us and Garima for helping me out here control the um, five screens that I have going on here or something like that. Um, and with that, um, everybody, of course, stay safe, be healthy. And I'm in California right now. So as of today, the San Diego County mandated masks. So 
it's going to be fun to go out the beach with a mask on, but that, that I don't mind at all. <laughs> um, so um, let's uh, wrap it up. Uh, thank you, everybody, again, and I'll be in touch um, 